of Edition F, a lifestyle and business magazine, mainly for women. And yeah, without further ado, I give the floor to you. Hi, Eva. Thank you very much for having us. Um, yeah, we were kindly introduced already. Um, so this is Nora, just to introduce her again, and I'm Suzanne. And today we wanted to talk about um, the 10 questions that will make you understand whether or not to start a startup. Because when Christoph approached us basically to come here and, and to speak to you, what he was saying is, I really want people to, to understand whether or not it's, it's the right thing for them to found a startup. Because you need passion, you need all kinds of things. So just tell them what was your journey, what were the questions that you asked yourself. And yeah, we wanted to share basically all the questions that came to our mind before we started Edition F. And um, yeah, the questions that we collected along the path that is now 20 months, something like that. So, but before that, I just want to give you a little glimpse again into what is Edition F, because we were now introduced as a business and lifestyle magazine, and actually we're in the phase of relaunching um, tonight. So um, we're kind of under pressure because afterwards we're going back to the office and really wanting to present a new website. And, and now we're under pressure because everyone knows. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good, actually. So um, we want to do the, the step from be being a magazine, mainly with content, all the way to community, which means really inviting our audience. What we want to be is the digital home for ambitious women. Between 25 and 45, they're urban, they're strong, they're mainly academics. Um, and they really want to reach their own goals. But of course, there's also men in the audience and we do want to reach out to you as well. Um, we have 20% readers that are male, so um, all good. Um, but what we mean with community now, rather than magazine, is that we invite our users to really participate and create Edition F together with us. So from tomorrow on, fingers crossed, um, you will have the option to basically like write and publish your own articles and your profiles you can hand them into um, the magazine and then we review them and um, yeah, afterwards basically you can become a writer and author on Edition F and many more community features to come. But now it should be about the 10 questions that will make you decide. First question. Um, if you look at the media landscape, you see it's about glamour, it's about big financing rounds. Usually you you read about like over 100 million financing rounds from Rocket, Internet, or like over 10 million for like startups, or you, write about, you, you read about big exits. And that is your impression you take with you if you're not really working in the startup scene, I guess. For me, um, before we started Edition F, I worked as a managing editor for Gründerszene which is um, the biggest online publication in Germany writing about startups and the digital scene. A little bit like the German tech crunch, <laughs> we always used to say. <laughs> um, and founders always told me about the dilemma in their lives, about like the big moments, the, the really positive moments. But that is only one side. Actually, um, as soon as we founded Edition F, <laughs> and I switched from my journalism perspective into the founder's perspective, everyone started to talk really honest with me and was telling Susanne and me like, oh, I had so many ups and downs and even for like the biggest and most successful German startups, there were like times where they were just before insolvency, for example. And that is something you always have to keep in mind before you start a startup, not everything what you read is like, it's only 1% of the truth, of the reality of founding a startup. Okay, so the next question is, most of the time when you plan on starting a startup, you have an idea and you ask yourself, is my idea good enough? And when you read magazines just like Grundlasen or you look into TechCrunch or even Business Insider, all these magazines, all the media, what you see is there's basically two trends. One is very much focusing on money, the other one is very much focusing on passion. And um, it's, basically, it's basically these two angles that always feel like they can't be combined. And if you look at role models, the most successful founder, um, Oliver Zamba, he would probably not very likely invest in a startup that's only driven by passion and that is not 
bringing in revenue from day one and is scalable from day one and is just about really making it big, being the market leader and probably going down even the IPO path as you did now with uh, Zalando. So you have to ask yourself, which way do I want to do I want to choose? And to be upfront, nothing's wrong about making money. We also want to make money, but um, startups means amazing highs, and it also means pretty devastating lows. And if you're really behind your idea and you're fully in it with passion, with the right co-founder, then all those lows are much easier to handle, basically. And we can definitely speak from experience because the last 12 months since the relaunch, there were, there were great phases, but then you also experience like maybe revenue doesn't work, maybe the business model at some point is, is a little bit tricky and you have to adjust. Um, yeah, maybe users are not as easy to win over. So um, if you're behind the idea, then you're not doing the rocket internet way saying, okay, three months, six months, it didn't work out, we just ended. You can keep going and you survive and you can become big. And um, so what you have to ask yourself is simply, what is it that drives you? Where is your passion? And is that, is that right? And then basically go out and talk to people and find out how it resonates because if you're in your own bubble, that doesn't help. Feedback and good advice. It's a really good question we wrote down here. <laughs> um, because you definitely shouldn't be afraid to talk about your idea. I talked to so many founders who's, who told me, uh, no, you have to sign an NDA first, or you, it's, we are in stealth mode, I cannot tell anything about our company. But in my opinion, it's a big mistake to do that because you have to talk to, I guess, to your customers, your future customers, it's really important. You also should talk to investors early on if you think about getting funding and you definitely should talk to your family and friends, to different experts from like different fields, what your business, your business is related to. It's super important to talk about your idea and also to not be afraid to change something you believed in before. Um, so talk about your idea and get, but who to find, like where to find people you can get advice from. Like for us, it was actually super important to talk to different founders. So I can only advise you to go to events and to also write emails or like write via Sing or Facebook or LinkedIn to people you think who could give you a qualified um, feedback. Actually, we did that a couple of times. For example, we wrote an email to... Um, yeah, yeah, for example, like something we cannot do is coding. <laughs> so um, we knew from the beginning we need programmers, but we couldn't do like a technical interview with a programmer. So how to find out if he or she could be the right match. So we decided to find someone who could give us advice at this really important topic. So we talked to different people from our network to find out who could be interested in helping us with that. And then we found our first mentor, which was Mark Herbrechter. He, he worked for Rocket Internet for a long time. And he was super helpful with like all the technical interviews to give us advice. Who was who is a good match for us as a programmer and also to reach out to his network because he had a network to like all the programmers. We didn't know any programmers except for two, I'd say. And um, that was a really good thing we did. And also talking to founders is super important because all these ups and downs you will prob pro probably make in your future, they already through. So talk to different people, it's super important. So can I do this part time? Um, very often when you want to start, um, you kind of feel like, yeah, I'm just trying out. And so I make my baby steps and I figure out whether or not my idea is right and if I can find the right co-founder and maybe start a little freelance team. Um, I can do this part time. Because everything that's basically blocking us from really committing right from the beginning is simply like running down to one word and that's fear. And um, I personally can say I also experienced fear 
before really diving into this. Um, what happened is, um, after four and a half years at a very big agency, a PR and advertising agency, I switched my job, so I um, joined Nora and her former employer and um, built the communications team there. And I was still in the trial out phase, so six months where you can easily get fired because there's no, yeah, there's no um, safety net basically in the beginning. And they experienced some troubles. They also started up, it's totally fine. Um, but I got fired. So very first time in my life, not necessarily the best experience, um, but I also realized, okay, I have good skills, um, I have a strong network, and basically just a few days later, um, I signed the new contract to a part-time job. It was very well paid. Um, so I finished my job at the former employer. Um, I went on a four-week vacation, and then I had the, had the very first day at my new job. Um, so I went there, and after five hours, I quit. Um, so that's usually not how I handle things and I also worked out basically to fill that gap that I kind of left after five hours in my new job. Um, but it was important for me because I realized I'm betraying my own idea. I'm betraying basically the success of Edition F, which was not even called Edition F at the time because on the day that I got fired, Nora and I sat down, I know, on Torstraße in front of um, the office and it was basically the very first time where we aired this idea. And it was just, it kind of felt like the impulse, the spark basically for us to understand, yes, we have to do something together. And it wasn't 100% sure what it's going to be. And it didn't have a name and no timeline and no funding and nothing. But it was right to fully step into it because of the thing that I said before, it's about passion. And I, and I felt I belong to the target group, Nora as well. So I know there is a need. We wanted to fill that gap. So everything that I could lose is basically a little bit of time. And um, that's why my take on part-time would certainly be no. What's yeah. the best brand name? What's the best name for my startup? <laughs> Suzanne just said that we didn't have a name for the, like, the first couple of months, uh, <coughs> no, weeks. So we sat down, we talked really often, we brainstormed a lot, we tried different techniques, we invited friends for dinner to be creative. We, we did online surveys. We did surveys, yeah. It was, and there was one name we really liked from the beginning, but the name was never on top of our like surveys. So it was always like some people liked the name, some people didn't, and we were like, Maybe it's not the right name, but um, at the end, you actually um, have to listen to yourself, I guess, and we selected Edition F, and now everyone is super happy with the name and says, oh, it's such a great name for your company, and no one said that before, so it was a good decision, at least for us, to decide, let's take that name. Um, yes. Yeah, I guess it's just about understanding does it resonate with what your brand should say? What does it mean? Does it, does it go along with what you have in mind? And if your guts say yes, then yeah, just go for it. And a name... And for sure you have to do some research and yeah. check out URLs and <laughs> check yeah. out um, if there's another company called as you want to be called and so on. But um, if, if it's not the case, you should go for the name you like in the founding team. Um, is my co-founder a perfect match? Yes. <laughs> um, but usually when you, when, you start, when you start to talk about um, who to start your business with, um, very often what you see is you, f you want to find your complementary other. So it means I'm the numbers person, I need the creative person. Um, I think that's on one hand that's that's right because if you both have the identical skill set that might become a little bit tricky because eventually you do hit some boundaries where you need other skills. Um, Nora and I are still, we are alike in many ways but we also um, have the boldness basically within our relationship to, yeah, to to use the friction that you have on a creative level where you just realize, okay, um, we're both very strong-minded and we are not shy to express basically whatever, um, whatever we think. And sometimes that also means that you feel like 
you're kind of off path, but then you you come together. And just with everyone exploring maybe a little bit of, yeah, just off ground, then um, that really like is kind of bringing the things together and one-on-one -on -one is two. So um, with the skills, finding your best partner for us, we were, um, do you need help? Um, for us it was, we were good acquaintances basically for seven years. Um, and then in the last six months, as Nora said already, we worked together at our former employer. And that was a good kind of troubleshooting test because we realized, okay, we're not only good acquaintances and we get along on a private level during dinners or birthdays. Um, we also can work together and we have a similar mindset, a similar work approach, a similar work ethic. And I think it's much more important that you feel the other person is just as committed and you feel like you're both in one boat, so to say and you really want to um, take a ride across the ocean with it. And, um, and that's, that's what you have to feel. And I think certainly when you're aiming to build a scalable startup, and eventually you will invite and hire other people to come on board, whether or not as co-founders you give them options or shares, direct shares, um, or you hire them basically just as CEOs even. Um, and they do the operational stuff, and so you invite people in that have the skills that you are lacking. But for founders in general, it's so important that um, you have a you take that meta perspective. You just have to be above. Um, in the beginning, you have to do lots of operational things as well, from cleaning the toilet all the way to inviting investors and convincing them with your pitch. Um, but yeah, it's it's you still buy a toilet. Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, so at the end of the day, you, you, you are above and you have to have that strategic mind and you have to be willing to, to really do like the, the legwork as well. So um, if you feel like you've got that committed partner, it's probably the right one. And if you don't have the skills that you need, that you need then invite the right people in. That also sometimes doesn't have to be a hired person. It can be a consultant, it can be a good friend that in the beginning um, helps you with Excel lists or whatsoever. So um, just be open, communicate, and ask for help. How can I find investors and get funding? <laughs> yes, that's a really big and important question if you want to have investors. <laughs> and I... You keep asking it again and again and again in a startup's lifetime. That's also true. <laughs> um, I'm telling you a little bit like how we did it. I mean, we did two business angel rounds um, last year and then we did crowd investing at the end of last year, uh, running until the end of March, I think. And now we look for a usual, like a usual round at the end of this year again. Um, if I would do it again, I would definitely try to get the double amount of money from the beginning because it's really helpful if you can work with the money you, you raise for at least 12 months. Because usually it takes six months to get new funding. You definitely have to, yeah, sometimes it's less. Like for the first financing round, we, it took us, I guess, two or three months. But um, it's getting also a little bit more complicated if you have more to show. So what did we do? We First, you definitely have to do your homework. So you have to have a pitch deck, which is like a 10 slides presentation you show and can send to investors. There are like tons of um, really good examples out, out on the internet. You, you should check that out definitely. And you have to think about how much money will you need and for what where you need the money. So um, every investor, if, uh, if the investor is giving money to you, um, will ask you how much money do you need and how much money you want from me. So talk about numbers is also really important. I mean, everyone from us will, I guess all founders are Excel millionaires at least. Um, numbers are also a question of fantasy sometimes. <laughs> But you uh, definitely have to have a clue about um, your Excel numbers and also about um, your pitch deck. That is something you should prepare first. Talk about 
you pitch deck with different other founders is also really important advice I can give to you. And then you should um, start researching. I would definitely use different um, like data from like AngelList to Crunchbase. I would read a lot on like TechCrunch, Gründerszene and so on. I would try out to see, try, try to find out who could be a possible good match for me as an investor. Like who invested in sim similar companies? Who, um, because it's so, out there are so many different investors. They are like later stage investors who are not interesting for you at all at the, in, in the beginning. Then they are like early stage investors, business angels, VCs and so on. You, there are accelerator programs, incubators and so on. It's like a really, really big um, investors landscape you, we have out here. So think about what would be the best concept for me and read about it, look, look who invested in what company so far and then you have to do the networking. Go to events, like a really good page to find out what events you can go to a startup digest can check that out, it's for different cities, um, they uh, yeah, have many events on, on Startup um, Digest, which is really good, um, and go to the events and try to speak to the people you want to reach out to. If you don't meet the people at events, to talk with them and like say, hey, can I send you my deck, um, I am doing this, you always have to have the elevator pitch, so you have to have a really like, a five sentence pitch so the person gets interested. And then um, if you don't meet the person but you definitely think that would be a perfect match for me, you should try to get an introduction from a contact you know. So use your network, it's super important to use your network. Talk to people who know the, the person you want to reach out and ask for like an introduction via email. You should always prepare like a little text for the person because then it's getting much easier. It sounds simple but it's super important because all these people are super busy so write down a few sentences so the person only has to send this email to the person and doesn't have to be creative. Um, and then you can also attach your pitch deck which is also um, um, really yeah, helpful and then I would definitely um, ask for like a meeting. Don't be like, yeah, um, bye bye, and don't be concrete. You have to ask for something. Like you have to say, hey, um, I'm in London next week. Um, are you there? We, can we meet up for like a coffee so I can present my company to you? Actually, and a good story. Um, right now that you mentioned London, um, there was that one investor that we always wanted to meet because he's investing in mainly in startups with female founders. Um, and female topics. And female topics. And um, he also wanted to start his own fund. And um, he also likes to invest in content and media. So perfect. Um, and then we tried to chase him. So we had three introductions by three different people. We stalked him on LinkedIn. We stalked him on Facebook. And we knew that we would go to London last year in January. And um, only like, I think, four days or so prior to actually leaving for London, he finally responded after probably like the 10th Facebook message and he said, oh yeah, I'm available. So um, that, that was good. So basically just, you have to be bold. I mean, I, I really don't like stalking people, but sometimes, you know, it's, they're so busy and you're not on their radar and then you just, if you really want it, then you just have to go for it. And so he didn't invest, unfortunately, but um, still it was have good. Have you ever reached out again? It was yeah. too early. It was too early and we're not in English, so um, yeah, but still it's a very good contact and it was just his questions even were challenging enough that you go home and you know that um, you have new ideas and new focus and yeah, you always learn and yeah, the one thing that, that really helps is just be bold, go out there, ask. And also to keep in mind, um, investment is like an ongoing question. You will never really stop looking for funding. If you want, if you want gut funding, you will always have this question in your mind. Sometimes, like a, for a couple of months, it's a little bit more in the background, but it always pops up again and faster as you, you think, because maybe your business plan didn't work out as you thought, 
or like um, whatever you want to be, um, you want to grow bigger sooner or whatever, and then you always have to keep talking to investors. Yeah. yeah. Um, female founders, is it really harder? That's actually a question that Christoph, who invited us here, um, had for us. So. Um, usually we don't like to talk about so much about whether or not it's harder to be an entrepreneur and being a woman. Um, because at the end of the day, founding a startup, it's a challenge, it's an adventure, it's a risk, it's, yeah, it's, it's basically it's something that you have to commit and something that, um, yeah, it's, it's a jeopardy a little bit because it can be super successful or nothing or somewhere in the middle and once you have to do it there's a time where you have to decide whether or not to actually keep going because it doesn't have that peak or that super low. Um, and that's equal for both, actually, men and women. And I wouldn't like to separate. I think one thing that might be a little bit tougher is that um, the scenario that Nora was just describing when it comes to investors and looking at the investment scene, certainly in, in Germany, um, but also Europe um, and beyond, it's male dominated. So most people that we're pitching to, they're men. And when you are approaching them with an idea that is catering towards women, that's a very female take, then of course it's a little bit harder basically to convince them and to really make them um, understand the, the need and the market gap and, and the potential. Um, because they don't really feel it, they don't feel the urge that this product, this idea is really missing. Um, at the end of the day, there's, there's one language that's really uniting, or actually not uniting, but that's universal, and um, that's numbers. So when you talk numbers, everyone will understand, whether or not it's a woman or a man in front of you, and if you are talking to VCs, it's a little bit different to business angels, then they do want to understand the numbers, and if you're convincing here, then they also invest if you're the right case. Um, but I think in the beginning, the one thing, and it runs down to, again, what I said in the, in the beginning, um, is if you're looking for starting, f start funding, if like pre-seed or business angel round, what, you have to find the people that you bond with over the idea. So it's, it's about the passion. Is the spark really in the room when you pitch to the person? And is that person really wanting to support you, not only financially, but also beyond with their network, with their know-how, simply with their support, also in like darker moments which will arrive. So um, if you find these people, you will convince them with your idea, but have the numbers ready because they are universal. That's mine. What's <laughs> the worst thing that can happen? Okay, definitely failing completely and in insolvency, I guess. <laughs> mm. But I, I was really afraid b when we first sat down and um, we were talking about like the idea and should we definitely should we do it or not? Because I was quite happy in the job I had before, and I was sure I'll get more money soon and so on. So it was all really safe, and I was happy and so on. But I still had this feeling I want a little more. So um, in the end, we jumped in really cold water, I'd say. We did like home office in the beginning. We didn't have much money saved. We spent all our like um, savings we had. And um, we got a new financing round just before we run out complete. We completely run out of money, actually. we. Like one week later, we wouldn't have been able to um, pay our freelancers we worked with at that time. So you also have to be really lucky sometimes and always work hard on, on these things. Um, but actually after like doing this for 20 months, I couldn't imagine doing anything else ever again. I'm not sure if I should say that because maybe I will be an employee one day again. Like right now, I cannot imagine to um, to do that again, because. But still, if I like just before um, we really decided to do it, I, there was this um, sentence I really like from Sheryl Sandberg: um, "What would you do if you wouldn't be afraid?" 
And that was the sentence who popped up in my mind all the time again. And I was so sure, okay, if I wouldn't be afraid, I would definitely found this company. But I'm still afraid. And so what, what, what I did was talking to some f actually female founders at that time, I, I uh, know. And uh, I talked about that idea and what they think because my first idea was maybe I can, maybe we can actually handle to get investment if we still, when we still work. <laughs> so it's a little... So it's yeah, the part-time deal again. Yeah, it's a little bit the part-time deal what Dusan did with um, working for a company again. So um, we didn't manage to get funding. <laughs> Everyone told me, okay, no, you have to have your business plan first and you have to have the commitment that you really want to do that. So um, I quit my job and um, we decided to go on this journey and I would never say it was a fault, even if we would be failing one day, I would still be happy that we did it because in the last 18 months I learned so much, I've never learned before that much in 18 months, maybe not even in 18 years or like in 20 years of my life. So um, I could can only tell you failing is a possibility, but even if you failed, I guess it's still looking good on your VC, um, CV. VC. <laughs> Maybe for VC is not, but on your CV it's okay because if you you can always get a corporate job again, or like a job in a startup, that is something you can always do again or freelance or whatever. But sometimes it's just like this one moment you can found a company, and so if you really have a good idea, I would always go for it. So the last question is actually not really for us to answer because. Um, I hope we did raise some questions that are either in your were either in your head before or um, at least are now finding some answers. And the question is now whether or not you're ready to take the next step. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we were yeah. ready for the next step, so who else is? Yeah. <laughs> we are ready. <laughs> so, uh, can yeah, sure. I, I will so pass you the microphone and you can just introduce yourself so we get the sound. Okay. Hello. Yes, it Hi. works. <laughs> My name is Yara. Um, I have a practical question. Yes. I really have no knowledge of investing mm -hmm. or in yeah. all those things. Um, how much or what does the investor does he have a say in whatever you're doing if he invests money? That's what I imagine that he really... Mm -hmm. That really depends, actually. That has to do with how much money he invests. Okay. And also, like, I mean, if you, get, if you look for funding, you have to say evaluation. Like, what is your company's what? value? So that is really complicated in the beginning, actually, <laughs> because you don't have any, like, revenue you... I mean, like, we didn't have a product when we went pitching first, so... It's a virtual value. It's, yeah, what's, like, the expectations for revenue, what's the... How unique is the idea, how strong is the funding team, and at the end of the day, the very beginning, it's a game. You throw in a number, and if, yeah, if your investor that you're talking to doesn't faint, then you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And um, otherwise you start negotiating and then you have to have the right arguments and the right points basically to say why you think you're worth that amount. And then um, basically he invests X amount of money and then gets shares on your company depending on the valuation. So like for us, we did a um, 1 million free money valuation for our first business angel round. And we um, selected... Um, 125k from um, different business angels and they got shares for the money they gave us and now their shares for, for sure are like um, <laughs> they watered down basically <laughs> yeah so that is how it works and then you have like your um, Gesellschafter Vereinbarung. <laughs> your um, shareholders your, agreement. Yeah, your shareholders agreement. And um, it, 
It definitely depends. Like for some questions, they have to say yes, definitely. Um, for some, not. Yeah. So, like for example, that really depends on your agreement. But for investments above a certain amount of money, um, that's something you negotiate with them. You have to ask them whether or not you're allowed to invest the money. Um, but for the overall things like the day-to-day -day business, you don't do it. What you do do is they give, we give them a monthly reporting, mm -hmm. so they always know um, what are our user numbers, what are our spendings, what are the plans for the next month, all that. So they, they're always up to date. Um, and that's important and actually I find it um, helpful to always perceive investors sitting with you in the same boat because they invested their money and they want to see your business really succeed because otherwise their money is gone. So invite them in, uh, even talk about problems because at the end of the day they might be even helpful and don't be afraid. I mean, you all want the best for that project. Thank you. Um, Was it any helpful? Because yes. I, sometimes I'm so far away from like this really first questions, I guess it's... <laughs> so you so. evaluation, you go and raise money and they get shares. Okay, shares. Okay. And then, that's a small question, are there female investors? Mm, some. Do they exist? All <laughs> questions are always smart, you got in mind, I would say first. And then second, there are some female investors. We, for, to us it was never important if it's like a male or female investor actually, because um, if, if the person is a match, because um, right he has mindset. like know-how we can use, he has money we, can, we need, <laughs> or he has, uh, yeah, or like he or she has um, like anything else we can The right network. The right so network, so. Certainly in the beginning, it's just, a, it's, Rather focus on the people that have the right mindset for your idea and that you can share the, the passion with. Because in the beginning, it's, it's actually gambling. Because nothing's for sure. You have an idea, you know there is a market out there, you can even count that market and say, oh yeah, there's like 11 billion euros just in Germany and we can get like 20% of it. Yeah, it's just that, it's, yeah, it's crazy, it's just imagination running wild and sometimes Actually, that's it's never true. that easy again to get men money as before you launched your product because no one can check your numbers so if you really want to start a company I can only tell you <laughs> go out and get your money at first because then it's much yeah I mean it's much easier to be successful with money yeah imagine I mean you go out you have an idea you see the market value you see the target audience you have that great vision you have passion you have the skills you go out you really like you have that person and and you know there's a great atmosphere and he really or she really believes in you and if you would have the same scenario you started like really like bootstrap um, and you had like I don't know maybe 25,000 euros in savings and you started like six months even just with you with yourself and some friends helping and then you have like minor success, just a little bit of traction, just a little bit of revenue. Imagination has to run wild, and if you don't have numbers, it runs wilder. I mean, you also shouldn't lie. That is no. also a point. You should believe in what you're telling, because you have to report every month afterwards. And if it's completely different from what you told the people, there's also a problem. Yeah. So. Trouble. Keep that in mind too. <laughs> Thank you. Just be honest. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Chloe and I'm with G Tech. Um, I was interested when you said you know you'd done your job for five hours and then you quit it and you know what what was kind of going through your mind when you decided to make that leap. Well, um, I think the strongest emotion was simply betrayal. I knew that I had something else in mind and I was always upfront. I mean, when I started the job and I said, I'm going to do it part time, just two and a half days a week, um, they knew that sep like basically in, my, in the other half of the working hours, I would, um, I would start my own business and I would try to get it off the ground. Um, but when you sit there and you basically like, Everything that's on your mind is your own business. 
you know you know exactly what's to do what to do like and you haven't even fully started and you're and you're in it and you're writing your concept and your business plan there shouldn't be another space in your heart and your mind it should be simply focused and that's what i felt i guess i i also have to say i wasn't too happy with the job um the actual task so that certainly helped um, making that decision so quickly but yeah, I think if you decide it, you decide it. And um, there's the German saying, I don't have the English equivalent. It says, at some point, you have to sit down on one chair. And you can't, you know, you can't use two. So I sat down. And I've actually got a second question, um, which is, you talked about, um, you know, needing to be sort of flexible and changing your business model. And how has Edition F changed since you first found it? Mm. Actually, one of the biggest changes is actually that we started with a concrete focus on content as an online magazine. We also started a job board, which is still running and going great. And um, we had some community features. But actually, most of the features we had in the really beginning didn't work that good. So we had to, for example, um, Writing messages. writing messages. No one was writing messages on Edition F to like other people because there are so many networks people writing messages already. So maybe that's a feature we can have again in a couple of years or a couple of months or whatever. But it was too complex. Like the whole idea of being a community from the beginning was too complex. So we actually didn't focus on being a community for like the last couple of months and talk to many people, like what do you really need, what do you expect from Edition F. And one um, thing we figured out, everyone really loved in our community, even if we didn't ask for it, was writing articles on Edition F. So m many users reached out to us saying, hey, can I write, like, can I share my experiences, I made like this experience and I really would like to share with your community or like I'm an expert in this field and I really want to share my ideas and tell everyone I'm an expert. So giving a stage to mostly female females in this case, not, not especially writers or journalists, but like everyone, like, in, like a person working in HR for example or like a founder starting a company or um, a marketing person talking about marketing tricks and so on. So we will, um, like one of our new features will be user templates where they can easily write and publish articles and we push them if we like them in our magazine and on our social, um, social networks. I think it's, um for us it was actually important to, if you want to create a brand and really set a certain tone, for us it was important to go with the content arm because um, with the content we could say what do we stand for and that was bridging basically the topics business and lifestyle which haven't been really bridged before um, or connected actually for females. Um, very likely and that's where Edition F was coming from is when you look at the media landscape it's still very separated so you have economical, business, career, magazines, publications, online, offline, um, but they're very much catering to a male target audience. And then on the other hand, when it comes to female content, whether print or online, it's often about fashion and beauty and gossip and the newest trends. And we wanted to connect the dots because, of course, women like all these topics, but they also want to have a career. 50% of the German academic graduates um, are female and the topic of diversity is much more prominent nowadays for companies and actually relevant for their economical success. So, um, and we thought we need to create that digital home where we have the, this content and where we have this kind of like know-how and inspiration and um, so we set the tone and had that atmosphere and created that kind of brand identity so to, call, so to say. And I think right now where we have done that legwork to an extent, because it's still going on, um, it's good that we have a certain community and now invite them actually to contribute. Because 
the next step is from consumption to contribution. And if you want to create a community, you, ha you have to open the doors and sometimes even give a little bit of your, um, yeah, maybe responsibility also to other people and yeah, let them create their digital home. Because if you want to create a digital home, you have to make someone feel home. Hello, my name is Thomas from Gründer Metropole. I have a question about your business model. I just had a look uh, to your magazine and I saw a little bit um, affiliate marketing, a little bit e-commerce and your job board. And we know that it is really hard to earn money uh, with an online magazine, also with printed um, journalism. And um, probably you know that uh, Gründer Szene, our colleagues are burning money every month. So all over the year, it's all about one million euros. So how you would lie or how you could earn money on a long term or three or five, three, four, five years. Um, what's your business model for the future? Mm. Um, well, you're right. I mean, at the moment, what we're doing is we're doing native advertising. It's um, all kinds of things that can be editorials, that can go to campaigns with user-generated content, there can be landing pages for companies then always um, always like uh, labeled as sponsored content. In German it's Anzeiger, so um, very, being very transparent here. Um, but all the way to events, you know, it's simply about creating a brand connection between the B2B client and Edition F. Then with the job board, for us it was important actually to, if we talk about business and lifestyle and career and opportunity and chances for the target audience we're aiming to reach, um, we wanted to present them a look behind the scene for companies. So we're really like moving on the company profiles now, which is a subscription-based models for corporates to have a premium profile on Edition F, really like with videos, photos, text, all that. Um, and then having the jobs um, also being paid. That's still very traditional, but um, with the community basically, and um, what we see is, or what we want to develop is some sort of freemium model, which is um, eventually having um, premium features that can be online mentoring, offline mentoring, that can be um, coachings, but digitized, um, so not like the offline kind of classic um, workshops. Um, and many other things actually that we're talking about right now and I think it's it's very much lying within the potential of the of the community also to have a freemium model and then extra services um, database um, stuff so I guess the biggest difference we have um, if you compare edition F to like the usual mass media out there is that we really uh, look at our target group we have like a really concrete target group which has no real spot online so far. So there are like for sure many job boards, there are many different blogs and magazines, there are, but no one is really catering to the needs of our target group. And the target group is really under, like underestimated, I think, because women, they are out there, they are for sure like almost 50% women, but not everyone is in our target group. But it's so many women from like um, almost everyone who studied or is like aiming to be more successful is in our target group. So that is a really big um, advantage we have if you compare us to, for example, to like Spiegel Online or all these like news pages. Second question. Um, but there are big portals or online services like Wundervibe or other um, media um, offers, especially for women and yeah. not only for older ones, also for younger ones. Mm -hmm. So you are in a high competitive market with traditional publishing yes, houses cool. and traditional magazines. I understand uh, your point of view to, to build a community and to build services around the community, yes. especially for a woman or a younger woman, so for the next generation, probably. But um, could that be profitable? Yeah, sure. I mean, actually, all the magazines you um, talked about are not really, in my mind, competitors because they um, definitely 
write about really like yeah, about all these topics like gossip, like diet, like health, kids, kids, and all these topics. And for, for me, at least for me, I mean, I'm also reading a gala um, when I'm flying to Munich, but this is not really any intelligent content for me. So, well, that might be a little bit harsh, but I think no, it's, it's not at least intelligent content. Sorry, it's entertaining content. It's entertaining, which, which, yeah. which is also something I really need, but it's not something I find I found before I just left. Actually, I think it also has to do with the approach in general. Um, I think if you look at similar, um, yeah, businesses, basically always as competition and. It, it's really tricky because you isolate yourself and what we do rather is actually partner with them. Um, I mean, we do have many articles on um, basically bringing together business and family. So we do speak to many um, mother blogs and invite them to publish their content on our side. They publish our content on their side. And it's simply about using the synergies. Rather build a network instead of isolating yourself, always wanting to be the market leader, um, in your single spot, that won't work out. I mean, we also work with Manager Magazine or Capital, for example, and have corporations with them or Handelsblatt or Huffington Post. So we're pretty open for all kinds of also like corporations in terms of um, networks and so on. And that is really helpful for us. Mm, I mean, we haven't talked to Wunderweit, but maybe we should also talk to them. There might be some synergies as well, but we are not really afraid of competitors. I think in terms of profitability, um, I would say there's a definite yes, but that has mainly to do with building that community, um, which has rather an emotional loyalty, basically, with your brand, is very different than a brand that you only consume and that is kind of like practical or efficient for searching certain content. And really like bringing them together and developing some sort of relationship with your users will allow for you to also make money with them because you listen to them, you understand what they want and you create the services that they need and then they are willing to pay for them because you, you want to provide something that will help them elevate their career, getting onto the next step, whatsoever. I have one more question. Um, so a lot of startups, especially when they're small and then growing their like immediate team, um, tend to hire from their network. So you two are friends. Like, what what is your team strategy? What your, what does your team currently look like? And are you also then expanding your team from your friends to keep it within, you know, that same culture? Or what is your recruitment strategy for growing the team? I think one thing that we did do differently was um, usually when you see startups, they hire lots of super junior talent, very often starting with interns. And um, if you want to provide business content for um, women between 25 and 45, you, it's hard basically to only have that intern strategy because the content that you produce have to be a certain level and they have to also understand the needs and basically the world, the environment of the women that you target. So our strategy was rather to go with a little bit, let's say senior level people and, and bring them in and rather have a smaller team, but be more efficient and really stick together very tightly. Um, yeah, but of course, I mean, our personal network was really helpful. I mean, our very first hire, the front end developer and designer was, um, yeah, a colleague, friend from one of Nora's best friends, um, and then um, yeah, oh, managing editor. Yeah, right. I was studying with sure it was also a network, but then like Sylvia, she's an editor in our team. We found her through like a, a usual job ad. Same with uh, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and same with our. Um, we also back use different club. like newsletters to push it. Um, into different networks and so on, yeah. Culturally, it's important, yeah, it's important that you have a good feeling. When you do the interview, you have to have a feeling that someone understands the idea, that the person is really willing to just um, do everything to, to really um, make edition a better and bigger. And um, yeah, simply, you have to have a good gut feeling, I guess. Thanks. 
So if we don't have any huge pressing questions, we can wrap it up there. We've been going for over an hour. Um, if you, I know you have a pressing thing to actually get back to. Yeah, with the, stay for a little we that would be great. Super. Thank you so much, ladies. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Jim.